Welcome to Dust Geek. No, your eyes do not deceive you. I am in Windows 10. And it's been a long time. It's not like I haven't booted into Windows 10 in between, but it's been two years since I've used Windows 10 as my daily driver. In 2016, towards the end of 2016, is when I started my journey checking out Linux. I am not a OS snob, by the way. I love Linux. That's obvious uh, and have fallen in love with it but if somebody came up with a better solution if there was a better operating system if windows improved tremendously uh, i would switch because i'm more interested in the productivity of an operating system what i can do with it and so i switched back then not expecting to stay with linux i expected to go back to windows 10 where i had invested money in all the various applications that I was using. I think I was using XSplit at the time, which I had a subscription for. I was using Adobe Premiere. I was using these paid for programs and some open source programs as well. But uh, after 30 days of the challenge, or I spent 30 days forcing myself to learn and use Linux. And then afterwards I realized I didn't need any of these programs anymore. So I haven't gone back. And a lot of the content that I do is based on Linux now. And obviously, I'm on the Destination Linux podcast, and it's kind of become a part of my life. But to that point still, I would use a different OS if there was a better option out there. So I've dabbled in Mac OS. I like Mac OS. Um, I dabble in Windows 10 every now and then. And I thought, well, it would be kind of cool to do a comparison now after being gone from Windows 10 for so long and play with it for a couple days and then do a review and show you kind of what I found. Now, for those of you who are Linux enthusiasts and free and open source enthusiasts, you may not find a ton of value other than this is Windows 10. You may not have seen it for a while uh, in this video, but for those who are considering or thinking about switching, which a lot of the people on my channel are newer users to Linux or people who are trying out Linux for the first time, then you may find this video to be insightful, but really this is just going to be ramblings of my opinion and I'm going to show you some scores and things that I captured with Windows 10. So when I first booted in, the first thing I did not miss was the updates. Oh my gosh, if you haven't been in Windows for a while, uh, you're going to update a lot. Now that in itself isn't bad. I mean, what's wrong with updates is just the way Windows goes about updating. So you're constantly kind of stuck in this loop of every time you restart more updates, more updates, more updates, and it locks your entire PC out. So for those who are not familiar with Linux, it's a little bit different in the Linux world because you can do all your updates while you're still using your computer. You don't have to restart and sit at a screen and watch percentages kind of count away. So uh, that was a little odd for me. Uh, to get used to. Everything had to be updated, NVIDIA graphics drivers, all of this stuff, and I had to sign into these applications, which that was, again, something I hadn't, haven't had to do in a long time is sign in to be able to download updates um, uh, to various websites and different things like that. The other thing, of course, that popped up was all of the licenses that I had that expired from you know, Adobe Premiere wanting me to pay more for upgrades to virus scanners. I think I was using WebRoot uh, at the time being expired. All this stuff expired that I was paying all this money towards. And so that was kind of different, right? Um, especially when you're in the Linux world, a lot of free and open source software, you can donate to it, which I highly recommend, but you're not forced into this kind of paywall thing. And you can use a lot of that free and open source software in Windows too. So uh, that's important to note. So what I did is I kind of just grabbed some of my experiences and I'll show you guys some of these things as we're going through Windows 10. You know, my first look into Windows 10 is it's pretty, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with the aesthetics of it. Obviously, if, you know, I had left all these icons here, but you could take all the icons off the desktop and you have this good looking desktop. One of the things I really... Um, thought I would miss, but ended up really not liking is this menu system here. So I've kind of always dug the Windows 10 view when I was in it of how you can kind of look at apps. But then I guess now that I've been in Linux and come back to it, like things like this, where you have apps that are hidden in these yellow folders 
instead of just showing you the icon. I don't know if that's something to do with how I installed them because they were downloaded or what, um, but I guess it puts all these things into categories and sticks them in a folder, so you just get a lot of yellow folders within your view and lots and lots of scrolling, which we'll go into Linux in a minute to kind of show some of the differences there, uh, these things that we touch on. And then you've got these little cards you can move around, which is kind of a cool idea, except there's a lot of advertising, especially if you don't go in and turn it off that can happen here. So they're kind of pushing things. So now it's not really a menu. And then see how it kind of cuts off text here. It's, it's again, not a problem. Don't get me wrong. I'm not nitpicking little things. It's just, it's not as clean as I remembered or thought it was. So what is this? Another update? Okay. Uh, iTunes, of course. Update every five minutes for iTunes. Um, so OS updates. So the first thing is, and I just picked a winner. And of course, this is my opinion. So as we're going through these, you can pick your own winner for sure if you have experience in both. But OS updates, obviously there's no lockout in Linux. And so it's very simple to do updates. It's very secure to do updates. You're not going to random sites and downloading files, which we'll get into that a little bit more to do updates. It's just very, very well implemented uh, within Linux, a couple commands or a click of a button in most distros and you're up and running and you can still work while you're doing those updates. You can still be productive and Windows locks it down. So Linux to me is the clear winner here. Now peripheral support, <clears throat> this is where I think Windows obviously has the advantage. Now, in a lot of these areas that Windows has the advantage, I noticed that the advantage is there because of their dominance within the market, meaning the manufacturers or developers, they are writing for the dominant desktop environment. Even though Linux dominates on servers, Windows dominates on the desktop. That is not something that is a disputable fact. And because of that, um, obviously the drivers and support for peripherals and things is generally geared towards Windows. With that said, Linux works with most peripherals. In fact, there are articles out there now about even things like that Microsoft uh, touchscreen dial um, that they featured last year now working within the Linux kernel. And obviously, Windows has contributed a ton. Microsoft has contributed a ton to the Linux kernel themselves and even releasing a new operating system for some of their new devices on Linux. So, you know, there's a lot more partnership there than people may be aware of. But in any case, um, I think Windows has a much better identification of hardware, obviously because the hardware manufacturers are going to write their drivers and support and things for Windows primarily. So, namely sound and wireless adapters within Linux, a lot of this is all built within the kernel. And for the most part, it works very, very well. You can get these old machines, you can get new machines, you plug them in, you'll have internet and go. But every once in a while, depending on the wireless adapter you have, you will find yourself without Wi-Fi until you plug it into an ethernet core, uh, port and do an update uh, to get to say a later kernel that may have that driver, et cetera. So it's, it's distro based and that type of thing. But there's not always support for everything out there out of the box. Whereas Windows, if it doesn't work with Windows, where would it work type of uh, situation? NVIDIA and other apps, though, require you to log in to do updates in Windows, which I think sucks. Um, I'm very well known, and so are many of the other folks who do audio work like podcasting, to say that Linux is behind with Pulse Audio when it comes to advanced sound features. Now, this is going to be arguable to a lot of people in the Linux world, and that's okay, it's my opinion. But I have, for instance, a DBX286S hooked up to a Focusrite, to a, what is this, like a Procaster or something like that? Uh, a Rode Procaster, that's what it is, Rode Procaster mic. I have separate speakers here. I have a separate amp as well for headphones. So I've got all this audio equipment and Pulse Audio just, um, it, it tends to have issues where um, when you're switching between some of this various, like the amp and the focus right, sometimes it'll get staticky um, and, you know, require you to re-log in. At certain times, it's hard to switch different peripherals. And a lot of that, again, if you just use speakers and headphones and maybe one amp, you're not going to have an issue. But when you're switching to a lot of different audio equipment, that's where Pulse Audio kind of flops and I don't have those issues in Windows. So for that reason, for better driver support out of the box, even though things like your gaming mice, keyboards, and all of this stuff works in Linux, 
I'm not going to be able to download the drivers for my keyboard, for instance, to play with the RGB settings or my mouse. Um, while there are some people who write, you know, kind of software that is not made by the manufacturer, but will allow you to make some of these changes. It can be a pain in the butt to get working in Linux. So obviously peripheral support windows wins. Um, and that's probably because of market share in the gaming side, most AAA titles and other games, windows has better GPU support. Now, Nvidia and AMD are changing this very quickly. We're getting a lot faster updates to the drivers, a lot more involvement from those manufacturers, but it still goes without saying that the AAA titles, we're getting tons of more games in Linux, obviously with Steam support and installing games is as simple as clicking a button in Steam, just like you would in Windows or any other platform, but still they're behind in the AAA games. We usually get them later, like 30, 60 days later or more even longer before these games will land within Linux. So if you have to have the latest AAA games and you don't have a console or anything else to play them on, Windows kind of wins here. Now there are lots of indie games and indie developers and I have hundreds and hundreds of games that are in my Steam library for Linux. And there, it's a blast to game in Linux and you've seen some of my videos, I get ridiculous frames per second. Um, in both Windows and Linux and even did comparisons between the two and they're within 10 frames of each other and we're talking like at the 150 plus frame per second range so 10 frames not going to really make a huge difference at that point but it's worth noting. Privacy settings uh, obviously this goes without saying the privacy settings within Windows are fractured they lack real true control uh, apps have these ridiculous permissions that make no sense. You get kind of forced ads into various portions of Windows, including in your menu. Yes, you can go in and turn some of this stuff on, but I will show you how ridiculous this all is within Windows. Encryption options additionally are not available unless you're in a pro version. And even then the key is stored on Microsoft servers. So not exactly what you would consider super private um, in that case. So Linux privacy out of the box, you get no ads anywhere kind of forcing themselves on you. Um, the applications have limited controls due to the way the file system structure is. You can view the source code since most of the stuff there is free and open source. I think the software you download is free and open source. Um, permissions are not inherited on install, so it doesn't get access to all of the you know critical portions of the kernel uh, based on install and home folder and OS encryption are there as a default for install within Linux. So privacy without question is one of the reasons why Linux wins. So let's go here and type in privacy settings. And here is our long list of things that you can turn off in privacy settings. So let apps use advertising ID to make ads more interesting to you. We turn that out. Let websites provide locally relevant content by accessing language lists. Let Windows track app launches to improve start and search results. Show me suggested content. Know your privacy options. There's also going to be a website that we go into for all the other services that you have to turn in. So all of this stuff has to be manually set location information turned off, the various apps and their, you know, location services, the camera stuff. These are all the apps that can access your camera, all the apps that can access your microphone. You have to individually toggle all this stuff, your notifications, uh, account info, let apps access my name, picture, and other account info. I mean, it's just, it's kind of a privacy disaster in Windows, really. All of these areas just to try, attempt to try to have some level of not having all of your data meta grabbed. Background app running, app diagnostics. Um, there's also, know your privacy. There's also a whole area I saw the other day where it was like a whole new section online that you had to go to as well for all the other app services out there, which was just crazy. I might not be able to find it here. Here it is. So manage my info that's stored in the cloud. So here's a whole nother section of the privacy stuff that we have to get into. Stay in control of your privacy. So you got sign in with your Microsoft account and you can deal with Cortana's captured information, location information, Xbox, Office, Skype, 
marketing preference, all this other products that they have that are metadata grabbing as well. So there you go. Privacy, clearly Linux is going to win in the privacy customization. Limited customization requires third-party apps and results vary. Linux, I mean, this is well known, literally anything you want. You don't like file manager, there's 15 or four of you them to choose from. You don't like the way things look, you wanna add new taskbars. I mean, some of it's distro dependent. If you're talking about things like maybe GNOME and stuff, uh, maybe a little less uh, customization, but certainly still far more than you're gonna get in Windows. Um, so some of the options that we have here, let me move myself out of the way. Um, in fact, let me just get out of the way, dummy. All right, some of the options that we have here, the taskbar, lock the taskbar, automatically hide the taskbar. Um, so it's kind of tablet mode, some peak view stuff and things. Start, show more tiles on start. Why would you want that? Look how big the thing is already. I mean, geez, what would it just cover the whole screen? Um, so these are some of the, you know, basic colors, lock screens, some themes and things you can install. So you can do some basic changes, but uh, you're not going to, for instance, be easily able to change out your file manager. There's a lot of integration, forced integration with things like the Edge browser. Um, you're going to have to go in there and uh, to, to change you know, your overall panels and how they're set up and being able to interact with your various notifications or what widgets and things you want installed. You're not going to have those options easily available within Windows, although I did find a Tyler, which was pretty cool, which we'll get into in a minute. So customization, I mean, Linux without a doubt wins with hands down. Um, Windows is very heavy on resources. It's very bloated. So we can go to a monitor here and check that out. <clears throat> so it's very, very bloated. And this is everything from the install size. Obviously, to kind of make this point very clear and simple, you can run Linux on a USB drive like the whole operating system. In fact, I have a whole operating system on this USB drive. I can plug it in and I can use everything from the internet. It will save the session onto this USB drive. Everything runs from a USB drive. The Raspberry Pi obviously utilizes Linux. So these very, you know, low resource use devices like the Raspberry Pi, USB device, an older computer, even newer computers that are low powered are going to run amazing within Linux because it is not a resource hog. Windows, on the other hand, completely different story. It is massive install. It is a resource hog and you are going to have to have a higher end newer machine to be able to run it effectively. Now, Windows has even admitted this themselves. It's the reason why on their new Azure platform, they're using Linux. They literally said our OS is too bloated. So for those who want to argue with that, you're arguing against the very manufacturer themselves. So there you go. <clears throat> um, so resources, I think it goes without saying Linux is going to win that. Security, come on. Guess who wins this one, right? Uh, we all know Windows loses here. Malware, spyware, galore, callbacks to internet, uncontrolled permission systems, uh, no view into the proprietary software activities, fractured installation system, meaning every time you uninstall a program and things, it's going to leave fragments behind everywhere. Uh, admin permissions by default, single platform target for people who are wanting to target it. Whereas Linux, there is nothing that is 100% secure, so let's get that out of the way. Yes, Linux can get some of these things infected, though you don't hear about it very often, if or at all, because your root permissions allow a lockdown on your machine. You have open source code, so thousands and thousands of people are actively looking into the code, making sure that stuff like that stays out. Although it's not impossible, it's very, very likely they'll get caught very quickly. Highly targeted which is a myth that the people say Linux is not highly targeted. It runs many government agencies, NASA, the International Space Station, all of these people run Linux. So there are lots of reasons. There are lots of high value targets out there in the Linux world that someone would want to go attack it. It just happens to be a lot more difficult for one of the reasons is there's just a lot. There's a lot of eyes within Linux there is a lot of different distros out there. 
So it's very hard to target because they handle their file structures slightly differently. They handle their installations. They have different package managers, etc. There are so many different distro options within Linux that you're not going to be able to target the entire distro operating system of Linux in a single virus malware type entity. You're going to have to individually attack each one, go after one or the other. So that provides it some safety too. So that's interesting. I think Linux wins here. Now these next two are ties because I think they're just number one, highly um, personal. You know, you may, you may find the interface for windows is fantastic. I think that it's fractured with settings and control panels. There are settings all over the place. You have multiple control panels. There's like the dummy version, I think, which is settings, which has some of your settings. Um, but not all of them. And that's what that looks like. And then you have kind of your standard control panel, which has a lot more stuff in it, but very similar stuff as well, which is the more familiar for those who've been in Windows for a while, which you may get into. And then you saw the privacy in the 60,000 categories. And all. it just seems kind of fractured and layers upon layers of Windows on top of Windows versions that eventually became Windows 10 kind of creating that. With Linux, this is very dependent on the desktop that you choose. So whether you choose GNOME or you choose KDE or whatever desktop environment you have running on top of Linux uh, depends on how fractured it is. There is a lot of work that has gone on to making the settings and things less fractured within Linux. And in some cases, it's very, very streamlined depending on the DE you choose. But because there are still DEs out there that to me have the same fractured issues that Windows has multiple areas to get into the same type of settings but slightly different blah 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 this to me is a tie um, software wise here so the store is a hodgepodge um, it's kind of like a mobile store and a Android uh, very looks a lot like Android in fact kind of behaves a lot like Android has a Windows a lot of proprietary options obviously um, relies on the proprietary software licensing hell open source programs are available for windows as well but uh, they have to be hunted down a little more they're not in a single repository currently no centralized place to get that type of software so you're going to get that kind of proprietary software in the windows store and let's take a look at this disaster and the reason why i call the windows store a disaster is because of the permission system which is the same critique that i have for android which technically is linux with google crap on top of it but uh it's the permission systems just suck so i i'm gonna there was a specific app i was looking at yesterday i think it was like a blu-ray player or something but this is kind of throughout but because i know this one uh, had it i want to mention it so this is a blu-ray player right it needs to play blu-ray and we go down here and there's a place that you can actually see the permissions that it needs permissions info um which oh yeah this kind of gives you information on the permissions but uses all system resources so what does that mean all system use any and all system resources such as camera microphone or location without further notification you can't control app permissions for individual system resources via the privacy page for a Blu-ray player, that's crazy. Access your internet connection, use data stored on and on an external storage device. So I kind of get the storage device maybe because you may have a Blu-ray maybe file stored on an external device. Access your internet connection. I don't know why you need that for a Blu-ray unless it's like a DRM thing. But this use all system resources. That's the type of thing that just makes these stores such a liability and a potential for absolute disaster. And you see a lot of silly, stupid apps within here that have no purpose other than probably to trick kids into, and adults for that matter, into installing them. And they're probably Bitcoin mining through their computer, stealing privacy information, all of that kind of crap. Um, Obviously, it's not a much of a walled garden there like you would in Apple, but personally, I would prefer that, especially in this type of environment because it's just kind of out of control and you have a lot of people who are ignorant to computers who will just click that stuff. Reliability, 
Uh, Windows is stable, but I do not consider it reliable. Hanging applications at times, fractured updates, no containment to the applications, frequent reboots required to keep the system updated. In fact, after doing all the updates I did yesterday, and I logged in today to do this video, more updates galore. Uh, easily the most reliable uh, for Linux. That's why it's used for servers all around the world. Containerized applications make it so apps don't crash the entire system. Uh, I think Linux, without a doubt, anybody who's being reasonable would tell you it is far more stable. Noob friendly. I think Windows wins here. Windows is familiar to most. Most people kind of grew up with it, have used it their entire life. The interface is very simple. Um, the controls are hidden deep. The advanced controls are hidden deep within it. You know, things like if you stick a USB device in it, if you grab any peripheral out of the box at a store and buy it, you don't even have to look on the box to see if it supports Windows because you kind of know it does. Now, that has to do with their dominance in the desktop market, but it's still an advantage and you can't take that away. Um, Linux is leaps in the bounds above where it used to be. I mean, you can pretty much do everything you want to do via the GUI just like you can in Windows, but you will find yourself at times needing to use a terminal. It is not mystical or difficult, but people get scared because it's just text and doesn't have graphical little 3D boxes. You pretty much just take the commands, you kind of figure out a little bit what they do, you paste them in and hit enter and that's it and you're done. But that can be daunting for people. Um, and again, I talked about the peripherals and drivers, which can be a pain in certain distros in Linux, like for Ubuntu's and some of your main distros now, literally to install NVIDIA drivers, you go to additional drivers, click NVIDIA, restart your computer and you're done. You've got your drivers installed. It's actually faster and easier than it is in Windows because you don't have to register or log into NVIDIA site to do it. But there are a lot of distros out there that do not have that integration because they are free and open source, completely structured towards it. So you have to go through leaps and bounds of flaming hoops to get NVIDIA drivers, say, installed. And using the open source drivers, you're going to get terrible performance out of them. So you pretty much, if you have an expensive video card and want to do any type of gaming or intensive GPU activities, are going to need the proprietary driver. Um, advanced applications, I think Linux is far superior when it comes to advanced application of using your system. That's why most developers, administrators, everybody else are within the Linux platform, uh, or they dabble within it or have Linux installed within Windows, which you can do now for the powerful bash scripting. You get Python installed by default, virtual environment, server integration, all the security applications and capabilities for network sniffing, packet sniffing, all of that type of stuff you can do um, within Linux very easily. Whereas Windows, you're going to have to do a lot of customization and add-ons to get that same functionality. Tiling and workspace productivity, I think is superior in Linux. And of course, Linux is gonna win in the cost because it's free. Now, some people argue that their winter version of Windows 10 was free, but any new computer you're buying, that cost is baked in. Um, and I had a situation which people tell me they didn't where I upgraded the components within my machine and had to buy a new Windows 10 license because the motherboard and processor had changed. Other people told me their license transferred fine. So I don't know what the end result is at this point. Don't really care. Um, but that's it. So Windows advantages boiled down to one area in my opinion, which is market control. I went into this thinking maybe I'll go and play with Windows for a while, but there's really nothing here that I can't do within Linux, except maybe play some AAA games, which when I was in Linux, I pretty much just started using, playing a lot of um, older games, playing newer games that are from indie developers and some AAA titles that Feral and other people have ported into Linux. There's really nothing I'm missing over here. I'll, you know, maybe Fortnite, I haven't played it yet but uh, I could play that on my PlayStation. So I have a PS4 as well. So if there's some AAA game like God of War that I have to play, I'll probably just do it on my PlayStation. So Windows won three categories. Linux won eight. Two of them were tied. I think it was a pretty fair evaluation of Windows. Um, there's a lot that could make Windows a, an incredible operating system. There is a platform here that you could do that with. But with all the privacy issues, with all the fracturing, with the costs, with the lack of security, it's just not ready yet with the bloat and everything else on top. 
Linux, frankly, is just superior, in my opinion. And that's why I continue to use it. It has nothing to do with the cost. If Windows release Windows 11, which I don't think they're doing, I think they're only going to do add-ons from now on. But if they release Windows 11 and fixed all of these issues, <clears throat> and it was $200, and it was the greatest operating system ever, I would go to it. I'm not one of those people who are just going to stay with something because it's niche and it's cool. I just truly feel Linux is better. Now, when it comes to Mac OS, I dig Mac OS uh, operating system a lot, actually. In fact, if Linux didn't exist, that would be the operating system I would probably use on a full-time basis. I just love the feel of it, and a lot of it probably comes from my day-to-day -day work is in Windows as well. So because of that, when I would get on Mac OS, for instance, I didn't feel like I was at work still. Or as, um, you know, if I have a Windows machine, it always still kind of feels like, you know, when you're navigating through it, you're at work. And it gets boring because of the lack of customization and abilities to change things and swap things out for what you want within Windows. We have made it back from our adventure into Windows 10 and it was fun. I enjoyed going back and actually looking at it, trying to be objective and say, hey, am I missing out on anything? And I'm so happy to be able to report back that no, everything I need to do is here. Now, I did mention in the video about sound within Linux and some of the issues there. I will tell you that using Cadence and some of the KX Studio stuff here, I am able to configure my audio equipment so that I don't have issues. To be very clear, my main problem is with Pulse Audio directly uh, by its own install. You know, just the customization options, being able to do whatever I want within the system to customize it, to change, to know the security that's there, to have the software store, uh, to be able to access software without having a register and put in all these license keys and and repay up for everything is just nice. I donate if I want to. And so this is something that uh, I think you should definitely, if you've not given Linux a chance lately, check out again. If you tried Linux in what we call the dark ages, like, you know, five, six years plus ago, um, give it another try because it is a completely different world today. And I'm lucky that I think I started Linux two years ago because I've been able, that was, that was far past the dark ages of Linux and I was able to get in it and see the beauty that it is now and all the incredible work of all the ridiculously talented people who volunteer and a lot of them do this absolutely for nothing uh, to make this happen. So definitely if you start utilizing Linux, consider donating to those individuals. That's my video. Until next time, get out there and fill your brains. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to watch the video.